Well, good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome, welcome to the session today. A uh, couple of introductory remarks. The Canadian Association for the Club of Rome was formed in the early 1970s to promote the study and discussion among all segments of the Canadian public of the nature of world problems and the need to develop new policies, attitudes, and courses of action to ensure a stable future for mankind and to cultivate a new humanism that will contribute to world peace, social justice, and individual well-being. Our mission has evolved slightly. It's now to engage the public and decision makers on key global and Canadian issues by encouraging sharing of information and informing and motivating citizens and decision makers to take action to limit, stabilize, and reverse demands on local and global ecosystems. KCOR is intent on increasing our advocacy for better public policy and programs on climate change and environmental protection in particular. We invited Dr. Gerald Putney, a chemist recently made a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society to chat with us today on his experiences in what he terms the climate brawl. That is on uh, what's been happening in the interplay between climate change deniers, politicians and the public regarding policies and programs to get the climate crisis under control. And I'm sure uh, that uh, Dr. Cutney will uh, make his own remarks in just a moment regarding uh, my interpretation of the challenge before us. I'm going to read you uh, his short biography. Uh, Gerald is a commentator on mainstream media and social media on the politics of the climate crisis. He's authored a book, Carbon Politics and the Failure of the Kyoto Protocol, and is currently working on Climate Brawl versus Climate Denialism, the Politics of the Climate Crisis. He's also known for having inspired the popular hashtag on Twitter, Climate Brawl. On Twitter, he's ranked as in the top 100 global influencers in climate science and forecast, and the number one global influencer um, for education and public awareness in the climate change debate. He has a PhD in chemistry, he's an elected fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society and adjunct professor at the University of Northern British Columbia. He taught a graduate course entitled Climate Change and Global Warming. He's now living in Ottawa. He has presented several guest lectures at Carleton on climate change denial. Uh, a staff reporter with the Toronto Star wrote, Canadian researcher Gerald Kutney, who has wielded his PhD in chemistry like a blinding blade of science is a relentless Twitter campaign, probably the campaigner, uh, against climate denialism. So um, on behalf of KCOR, I'd like to welcome Dr. Cutney for being here with us today and uh, invite you to make a few introductory remarks before we start the question and answer session. Well, thanks everybody for having me today. I look forward to this. Uh, this is meant to be a casual sort of presentation. I'll, I'll give a, some brief introduction and I really want to ask your questions and all questions are fair and I'll certainly do my best to answer them. My introductory remarks will be is on the politics of the climate crisis. Why are we in a climate crisis? The answer to that question resides more in the US than it does anywhere else in the world. So I'll give some introductory remarks about the development of American policies on climate change. Mm -hmm. Scientists started showing up in Washington in the middle 1950s to warn politicians in Congress that climate change was going to be a threat. By the time we got to the presidency of Jimmy Carter, the president himself was much more interested, not too much so, but he was paying attention to climate change at that time. And by the time we got to the 1980s, the science had done more than enough. There is more enough evidence that climate change was real, it was here then, and that politicians had to start enacting policies. Unfortunately, that's as the famous saying goes, the shit hit the fan. This was during the Reagan administration who had very little to say about climate change, but he was for small government, free markets, 
He didn't want to regulate American business about anything. And that has become a main policy within the certainly Republican Party ever since. In 1988, though, Ronald Reagan started talking about climate change a lot. This was one of the pivotal moments in the history of policymaking in, in American politics and climate change. What had happened? There was immense pressure on the American government to do something. The real conference had been announced. It would take place in 1992, but it had already been announced at that time. The IPCC had been formed and it started to put together its first report. And what really shook Washington was Jim Hansen had stood up in Congress stating that climate change was real and he had physically measured it. Now, the reason that Reagan suddenly started talking about climate change was because this all happened in the middle of the election. His vice president, George Bush, was running for to be president. And so the only reason Reagan brought it up even then was to support George Bush getting elected, which was successful. I won't go through the history of all the presidents, what happened afterwards, but no Republican president since Ronald Reagan has ever supported any action on climate change. A few talked about it more than others, but there was no action taken whatsoever. Now what happened? Why does science affect, the science is the same for Democrats and, and, and Republicans. Why do Democrats seem to like and follow what the scientists have to say? And the Republicans have become a party of climate deniers. The famous response to that, and it's standard and it's true, it has to do with ideology. The right, especially in the US, but it's true for most places in the world, they don't like government regulations, period. And so they're more natural for them to reject it. Democrats, on the other hand, are not. They're more open to such environmental policies and government regulations. So that sets the framework. But that doesn't really explain why this got so out of hand. We went to the wacko stage with Republican presidents being so against climate change. What had happened, and this goes back to Reagan again, he was essentially telling American business, you regulate yourself, you do what's best for the market. And unfortunately, big oil took him at his word. And beginning in the late 1980s, they started the most massive propaganda campaign in the history of the world, hiring the top PR companies to attack climate science, to attack climate scientists. That campaign began over 30 years ago, and it is still growing strongly today. What that propaganda did was it inflamed the right. Because of their ideology, if it hadn't been for the propaganda, we wouldn't be discussing this today. There would be policies in place. But with this massive propaganda campaign, the Republicans became entrenched against doing anything about climate change. I spent a lot of a lot of my time also talking about climate denialism generally, because later on that propaganda campaign, which was initially focused at government and politicians only, but after about a decade or so, especially during the presidency of George W. Bush, started focus on the general public as well. Now what got the oil industry to start pushing against the general public had to do with the hype that came out of Kyoto, but more so after Al Gore presented the inconvenient truth. And then with social media, this climate denialism propaganda had a life of its own and it just quickly spread everywhere. And so it's so intense right now. For those of you that follow me on Twitter, you probably see the, the stuff I go through it sometimes <laughs> and many others as well. So generally, I believe that there's a climate crisis today because of the actions or lack of actions by the American government. This was driven by ideology that became catalyzed by propaganda that still goes. 
And when you look at try to change things, you know, how do you stop the climate crisis? How do we get out of this mess? It's pretty hard to change someone's ideology. There's no point even trying. But we can do our best to stop the propaganda. So that's my brief introduction to talk today. You can ask me questions about this or anything you want about climate change policies or politics or about climate denialism. Great, thank you very much. So we have a few questions prepared to lead off the discussion and we invite audience members to ask questions as we proceed. Um, if you wanna ask a question, please type a very short version of your question into the chat box and we'll welcome your question to Dr. Putney at any appropriate point. Um, keep your camera off and your microphone muted until it's your turn to speak uh, and then you can turn them on. Uh, afterwards, go back to the state uh, that you were in before, uh, muted and the camera off when the question has been answered. So um, I'm going to ask the first couple of questions for you, Dr. Putney. Sounds um, good. So the first one is you were voted as a leading climate change influencer. I wonder if you could tell us who do you think that you're influencing and in what ways? Oh boy, you really started off with a toughie. I actually have no idea. <laughs> <You're so awful. laughs> I'll, I'll tell you how I got into this. As most people in our senior age group, I, I got into Twitter because of my son. You know, he kept on bugging me, he says, you know, you should go into Twitter. So I got into Twitter, I don't know, a dozen years ago or something like that. And, you know, after about four or five years, I might have had a thousand followers or something. And I tweet the odd little thing about climate science. I repost an article that was important. Maybe there was something neat in The Guardian, so I'd share a link. And people politely responded. I get a few likes and stuff like that. But my son, my son kept on bugging me. He said, tell him what you think about, about climate change and climate deniers. I said, oh, you're nuts. Who in hell wants to hear about anything I have to say about, uh, about that sort of stuff? So one time I just tried it. And instead of getting two or three likes, so I, was 20 get, I suddenly was getting 20 to 30 likes. And that's when, and it, by the way, it wasn't something because I, I said something genius about, it. it's that people enjoy chatting to a certain extent on Twitter as well. They just don't want to get see hard facts and stuff like that. And one thing led to another, and instead of having like one or 2,000 followers, I ended up with 46,000 followers. And that leads to the influencer part. The, in, the actual comment from influencer, there's an AI site, and all they do is they analyze this sort of thing. How it works, I have no idea. It started a couple of years ago, and ever since it's opened, I've, I've been pretty well in the top 100, usually stuck around the 60 mark overall. Great. So my second question is, um, at KCOR, we tend to focus on facts, but do you think that facts are always sufficient to change mindsets, and are there other important elements that figure into people's attitudes? The sad part was the facts were there 30 years ago. And we've reached a stage long past that science itself can't do very much anymore. I actually can't think of anything that science can do to change the, the general movement of climate deniers, period, wherever they may exist around the world. We're, we're not talking about a little fringe group, by the way, okay? I've calculated how many climate deniers actually exist, for example, in the United States. It's over 100 million. Uh, and there are surveys that you can go back to calculate that sort of number. And so facts are not the answer. What is the answer is that when people start seeing it more themselves, and even that's not the answer, it is activism like exhibited by Greta Thunberg and others where activism has a, has a life of its own to a certain extent. I personally believe that we have to attack propaganda. There's a saying I tweet over and over again in Twitter. Propaganda repeated again and again becomes the truth if it's not challenged. And history has documented the horrible consequences is when propaganda is allowed to get out of control. And so certainly from a personal point of view, I believe one thing that we all have to do 
is don't accept this junk that comes out from, from, from these people. It's one thing that someone doesn't like to do a policy. I don't have a problem with that. I do have a problem is they use an excuse that the science is wrong or the scientists are corrupt. That's a horrible thing to accept. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to pass the uh, baton over to my wife, who's the current chairperson of the uh, Canadian Association for the Club of Rome. And I'm hoping Jean's there. Just ask her to unmute. Yes. Okay. So Jean, over to you. Okay. I have a, a, a question that's a little more directed towards politics and politics in Canada, actually. Um, recently, both uh, federal and provincial parties, political parties of all stripes, have uh, published their new programs, policies, and, and directives that they think they'd like to campaign on in the next series of elections. And they think these will address climate change. Um, to what extent do you think that these platforms will get us to where we need to go and how much influence we might be able to put on them to continue down this road? When you look at Canadian politics and climate change, let me face it, I'm a little bit biased, I'm Canadian, but we are far ahead of the U.S., and not just because of Donald Trump. Uh, you run into a situation that no matter what a political party does, there's going to be some vocal opposition, very strong vocal opposition, whatever happens. If you look at the fundamentals that have to be into place for a policy for climate change, many experts agree, number one is a price on carbon. And at least we have that in Canada for now. That was a very important step. It's not the end of the game, it's the start of the game, which people don't understand. You can already see in Canada the huge pushback that's continuing now about that price on carbon even though a good part of it's being rebated to all tax uh, taxpayers in the country. Going forward, for example, the Liberals have talked about net zero for 2050. That's fine, I like that. Everyone should be talking about net zero for 2050. But what's important is what you're going to do in the next five to 10 years. That is pivotal and we need hard action. And most parties are pretty weak on that right now. If you look at the Conservatives, we saw before what Stephen Harper had done. Uh, Andrew Scheer, climate policy, I slept through. I didn't, I didn't know what he was trying to say, which is typical <laughs> of, of, I can tell you what the right generally does. The Americans have done this very well. Uh, George W. Bush was one of the best at this and everyone else copied a sense. They say the same sort of thing. We're going to, we're, yes, we have to do something about climate change. We're going to put more into innovation. That always sounds good. It's not that pouring money into innovation isn't bad. Well, we've been pouring money into innovation and climate change for like 40 years. And look where we are now. We're so far past the innovation stage. And so don't take my comments the wrong way. We still should be putting money into innovation. But it's not the solution. So yes, do that. But don't put it in as saying it's a solution. You have to come back with hard policies. And I think all parties, the major parties are, are weak on that. It's hard though, when you're someone like the, especially in a place like Canada, we're, we're a very decentralized country by definition. And so there's other things that must be considered. National unity being one. You know, how far can you push Alberta before you reach a breaking point? Uh, I don't have an answer to that. I think J Jason Kenney is one of the worst climate denial politicians I've ever seen in my life. You know, he's, he's, he's more politically savvy than Donald Trump, but he's of the same inkling as far as I'm concerned. Alberta, though, is not Jason Kenney. They're far beyond that. And so, really, if you're looking in Canada, let's see the next three years. I'm just picking that out of the blue. We have to reach that breaking point with Alberta and settle it with them. And not to push them out of the country, but we need Alberta to come, come on side and say, okay, we agree this is going to happen. Until that happens, a lot of it is window dressing. Remember, the largest emissions in Canada, annual emissions by far 
aren't Ontario, it's not Quebec, it's not BC, it's the province of Alberta. And it's totally disproportionate because of the Alberta oil sands especially. And until that issue is settled, Canada is, is going to have, a, can't meet its Paris Agreement targets. And the other thing you have to realize is since Paris was signed, the fastest growing emissions in Canada have all been in Alberta. It's more than made up for any reductions we've done anywhere else. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Art Hunter, you're up, and uh, Jeff Passmore is on deck. Okay, um, thank you. I am uh, <clears throat> have been approached uh, and uh, uh, taken on by some colleagues of mine who have put the argument of which I'm sure you've heard that says Canada uh, produces less than 2% of the greenhouse gases released to the atmosphere, where, whereas China is greater than 50%. Why should Canada's economy be shut down by shutting down Alberta while China is off and opening a new coal burning generating station every two weeks? Well, how, how do you respond to that question? Mm, I'm sorry, Art. We, we only have an hour and a half for the presentation today, so I don't <laughs> think there's really time to go into that. This is an excuse. It's, there's no validity to that statement whatsoever. It's just that what's really strange is one thing when a Canadian says it, Americans are starting to say it as well. Because China has become so large, they're even using that excuse. Let's go back to Kyoto. At Kyoto at the time, the Americans were still well ahead of China, but everyone knew that China was going to go past the US on greenhouse gas emissions. Kyoto left developing countries to only have reporting restrictions, regulations that they had to do. There was no restrictions on greenhouse gases. And I remember reading at the time that the Chinese delegate telling the American delegate, your greenhouse gas emissions are luxury emissions. Ours are survival emissions. And that already stuck with me because we're talking about countries in poverty working the ways out. Go to modern times. Now China is by far ahead of everyone Finally, Chinese emissions are finally starting to level off somewhat, by the way. Uh, they're not declining, but they've leveled off quite a bit. China has the largest renewable energy capacity in the world by far. They have the largest renewable energy investments by far. They're still considered a development, developing country. They're, if, you, if you look at their emissions, on a GDP basis or per capita basis, they pale by comparison to Canada or the US. If they, if they had the same per capita emissions as Canada, their emissions would about triple what it is right now. Also, China is a exporting country for the world. And there was long debates on who should actually be responsible for emissions. Should it be the ones that produce it or the ones that use the products that are produced by it. And it isn't right or wrong, it's just a choice you have to make. But a lot of the emissions that China has are for other countries, especially for us in North America. Now the real answer to your, I must have been going on for a while, it does take an hour and a half. The real answer to that question that I respond back with, I don't live in China. If I lived in China, as long as I didn't get arrested, I would push them to make sure that they were trying to do something. I live in Canada. You take care of your home before you worry about what your neighbor's doing. So just because your neighbor's got a junkyard in his backyard, doesn't give you those excuses to do that as well. So there are other reasons as well, and probably can't think of them all right now, but those are some of the reasons you put forward in something like that. Okay, thank you. 
Art, I think you had a second question. I do, and and this is this is a, a a little more interesting. It seems like politicians all go to the uh, the same person for guidance in how to not respond to a question, and uh, you can always tell that they're not going to respond when they start off by saying we take this concern very seriously. <laughs> and then they proceed to what I, and I made a list here of, uh, they begin to dance, deflect, de uh, de uh, defend, duck, deny, defer, distort. Anyway, like, you know all the things that, that they do. And so I, I know it's a bit of a facetious question, but how do you, put a question to a politician, hold their feet to the fire, such that they respond to the question. What's interesting about that point is, it, it's across all political parties. It doesn't matter if you're a conservative or a liberal or NDP or whoever you are. What you see more and more is what you said. Someone asked a question, in fact, sometimes it's a joke. Somebody asks a question, especially as it's political debate, right? If it's election time. And what happens is the, the, the guy who's been asked the question he gives a prepared speech on something that has nothing to do with it. And you sort of look at it and you think, what are you doing? And that's because they don't care what the questions are anymore. I don't have an answer to that. But one thing that the way it used to happen, at least in the old days, I thought, is usually it's asked by a newspaper reporter or a TV reporter. They used to hold the politicians' feet to the fire. But now they all have gone wimpy. They just say, oh, thank you, sir, and then they walk away. That's not the way it's supposed to happen. It used to be mainstream media was a protector of us from, from such spin, political spin, and some, from fake information that politicians gave. You very seldom. And I have seen a few, it's not, it's, it's not all, but a lot of major networks and a lot of major newspapers no longer hold politicians' feet to the fire. If they're not doing it, it's pretty hard for us to do it. Okay, Jeff Passmore, uh, I think you're next in line. Hey, Jeff, how Thank you doing? You. Sorry? How are you doing, Jeff? I'm doing fine. Gerald spoke at Scaling Up a couple of years ago. Absolutely. So, Great conference, by the way, everyone. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Listen, Gerald, um, actually, Art's question uh, reminded me of a quote by Kim Campbell, that, uh, that an, an election is no time to discuss serious issues. Um, <laughs> but uh, in any case, you started off your uh, uh, answer to the question, why are we in a climate crisis by blaming it on the US. And I understand why you would do that because their emissions of course are much greater than ours. And uh, in fact, if they were a leader in that space, uh, it would have more impact than Canada. But on the other hand, uh, we cannot let, as you just said, if somebody has got a junkyard in their backyard, it doesn't mean why, why should you not bother to clean up your backyard. And Canada is certainly, uh, I don't wanna let us off the hook. We didn't meet Kyoto, we didn't meet Copenhagen. We're not on track to meet Paris. You use the term window dressing, and indeed, that's exactly what we've had from all of our politicians, whether they were conservative or liberal. Uh, it, it was nothing but, you know, wonderful words. Um, and this is this this is reflected in so many other issues that uh, Canada is dealing with, whether it's procurement of replacement for CF-18s or banning. Uh, Huawei, you know, from uh, the five uh, joining our Five Eyes friends and banning Huawei, uh, or <clears throat> what to do with Twenty Four Sussex Drive. We we just don't seem to be a serious country that can make up our minds about what we want to do about anything. And I think now with Biden as the president, and this is my question, if you agree or not, but um, with Biden as the president, <clears throat> if he's serious about some of the actions he and the progressives in the Democratic Party are going to hold his feet a little bit to the fire, even though he's he's a moderate, although in his first 50 days, he's been less of a Margaret, mar moderate and more of a progressive. But if he does proceed with a climate agenda, then he's going to eat Canada's lunch. 
because we're not ready to compete with, uh, with, with, I mean, yes, we are going to be on a track or we're supposedly on track for $170 a ton carbon tax. The Americans won't have a carbon tax, but they'll have other regulations that are just as effective. As you said, the carbon tax is only the first step. And if the conservatives ever win election, they'll probably get rid of it anyway. So uh, <laughs> I think we're going to have a hard time uh, keeping up to the Americans uh, under a Biden administration. I enjoyed your comments very much. Uh, first, I'd like to go back to Kim Campbell for a minute. Kim Campbell gets derided quite a bit in American politics. She was last conservative to support strong action against climate change. And she still supports strong action in climate change. So she deserves a lot of recognition for that. And actually, if, if she was running for conservative leader tomorrow, it'd probably be the best we could get there for, it'd be a long time before you get someone better than her. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. What the US was doing is never an excuse for Canada or any other country. Every country stands on its own what it does. And by the way, every country has serious faults on what it's done, whether it's regard to Kyoto or Paris or wherever the case may be. Even the ones that seem to have a good reputation. In the early days of Kyoto and in the late 1980s and going up to Rio, Canada was a global leader in pushing for getting things done. After Kyoto, we lost that. We lost it badly. You then went and described a whole pile of events that Canadian politicians just can't seem to address. In my opinion, I see politics generally, and it's, it's very bad in Canada as well, and maybe worse other places. You don't want to offend anybody. And so the only way you, you don't offend anybody is by saying nothing and doing nothing. The problem is the hard decisions, someone will always be mad at you for, for doing it. But that's what makes a strong politician. Nobody wants to have a politician that has a 90% approval rating. They're doing something wrong if that's the case. And so there's always two sides to a lot of these things. And you mentioned some good ones. It doesn't matter what you take. You know, and face it, we're talking about climate change here today. Uh, if the liberals or somebody else came out with a stronger policy tomorrow, whatever it may be, it doesn't matter. You're going to get the same thing again. You're going to get outraged by the right. And by the way, you're also going to get outraged by the extreme left. Now, so the politician can't win from, from, his, from a public viewpoint. Well, if you look at the great decisions that have been done in the past, whether it was Tommy Douglas and putting through for Medicare and all that other stuff that went on, it was extremely unpopular. So we need some politicians that have got some guts to make those hard decisions. Now, in fairness, we got to be careful we aren't penalizing them because they're trying to get reelected. And we probably won't if they do something we don't like. But really, I want to be, have a politician where people are screaming at them afterwards because that's what happens when you make the hard choices. Well, just a supplemental question, if I may, Mr. Speaker. Um, so <clears throat> moving then from politicians to the public, um, we saw what happened when Stefan Dion got out in front of the public and had some comments there or a, a plan on climate change and he was, you know, crucified. Um, so Justin Trudeau obviously is trying to f uh, find the balance, but um, uh, if and, and I, I, I like your comment that the <clears throat> we don't need any more science. I mean, the science is there, but I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, motivating or educating the public, because I think the politicians, uh, you know, they're leading from behind and the C Canadian public, even in provinces other than Alberta and Saskatchewan, which by the way, are trying to discover the future by looking in the rearview mirror. Um, but, you know, uh, the public is not necessarily fully on board with uh, doing the things that can be done to uh, arrest the climate crisis. Watching Stefan Dion gave me the impression that he was very sincere in what he was trying to do. But he wasn't very good at the politics. And the problem is sincere politicians that aren't very good at politics get raked over the coals for all the wrong reasons. And 
So that's sort of what happened with Stefan Dion. So you're gonna to have to help me again with the second part of your question. I just I well, I just wondered about the public and how we oh, yes, uh, yes. get the public motivated. Yeah, sorry, thank you. I think a prime example of that happened in late September of 2019. My wife and I have never demonstrated about anything in our entire lives before. But those were the, at the end of September, we had the climate march that was across the world. We had it here in Ottawa at that time. In Ottawa, I think it was over 20,000 people that participated in that march. Uh, my wife and I went downtown and we walked around for an hour or two. It was something that we had never done before. And 20,000 people when there wasn't really anyone famous there is pretty good for a city like Ottawa. Montreal, where, where, where uh, Greta had shown up, they had over a million people. And so if you ever want to see action on climate change, it's people like Greta Thunberg. It's the activists that are out there that can stimulate people's actions. And at the time, and she's done this time and time again, politicians listened to her even when she was just a teenager. And so you can't expect these people to carry us forever. But they're the ones that give us that shove. You need something to give you a shove. And whether it's a Greta Thunberg in the middle 2000s, it was the, uh, it was Al Gore and, the, and, and his movie. You need something that's not science. It's not somebody, it'd be great if we had some great politician could stimulus, give a stimulus to react. But what that external thing is going to be, I don't know. I just hope it's not simply going to be disaster after disaster. Remember what happened in Ottawa just over the last four years or so. We've had two major tornado episodes in a period of four years, which happened every few decades. Now we've been lucky, we haven't had one for the last two years. But if this shows up again, you know, people are going to react, but they're going to have to react for the wrong reason. And that's what science is trying to prevent, by the way. Science is trying to project what the dangers are for we'll listen before we hit the disaster. I just hope it's not the disasters that make us react because then we've really blown it. Thanks, Dr. Curtin. Um, I'm reminded of the fact that not too long ago, I was saying that if a million Americans died in a heat wave, we might get their attention. But now that we've had an enormous number uh, die as a result of the pandemic, I'm not sure that anyone is gonna do it. So the next question in line is John Legg. And Gabriella Griffin is your next. Uh, Dr. Uh, Cutney, <clears throat> you cannot start your video. Okay, I won't. All right, uh, sorry. <clears throat> I'll start my video, all right. First of all, I'd like to thank you, not only for being here today, but the role you play is so very important. Uh, some of us have been in the, in the debating and the fighting game for years and years. And after a while, uh, one either needs, as you mentioned, a push by Greta Thunberg or something else. So first of all, thank you for your role. That was very kind of you, thank you. Quick, I have two quick questions and one has to do with, can you be more specific about uh, the propaganda that you have seen that has managed to turn the minds and I think you're right, uh, once the minds are really turned, it's very difficult to drag them off that. But what, what are the propaganda points that have been used in the USA to change reasoning people into deniers? Can you elaborate a bit there? That's a, a, a very interesting question. 
the thing about propaganda, it's easy. You don't have to be brilliant. You don't have to be smart. You just have to have a message and repeat it over and over and over again. The greatest propagandists of the 20th century, and I hate to bring this up, but it, I think it's important to understand it, were both Adolf Hitler and Goebbels. And when yeah. they combined together, they did not win over the hearts and minds of the Germans through the brown shirts or military force. They did it by propaganda. I hate to go back and mention Nazis and stuff like that, but from the propaganda side, it just shows how relatively easy it is if that's your plan of action. Starting in the 1950s, we saw a different type of propaganda. Instead of coming from political actions or stuff like that, it came from corporations. And the first one was the tobacco industry, where they simply, what do they try to do? They didn't like the science about smoking causing cancer. The evidence was overwhelming. So what do you do in your propaganda campaign? You never try to win the argument. They are not trying to win the argument. What they're trying to do is say there is an argument. They're trying to create doubt. And that's all you have to do is create doubt. Exactly the same thing happened with climate change. It just so happened that the tobacco campaign was finally ending after the Surgeon General stopped the fighting and said, yes, it causes cancer, end of discussion. And that's when the propaganda campaign of climate change started picking up. And the same guys that were running the PR campaigns for the tobacco industry just moved over next door and joined the climate deniers and started doing it there with exactly the same techniques. If you look what happens, for example, in the it really got nasty during the presidency of George W. Bush. Where presidents, were, sorry, where, where scientists were attacked by the Republican uh, political elite. They were issued with subpoenas. They were threatened with criminal charges. That is when it just got wild. And the f most famous case of this, of course, is Michael E. Mann, who's who is one of the most famous climate experts in the world, who just has a new book out right now. And so the propaganda part is easy once you try to do it. You can take the, any case you want, and you remember, they never try to win the argument, they just try and say there is one, and they just create doubt. Good, thank you. Yes, that's a, that's a very good reminder. The, uh, Hitler Goebbels uh, business, and uh, and I do a thank you for the other uh, amplification. The other question I had had to do with geoengineering. I uh, I'm an admirer of Gwyn Dyer, who wrote the book called Climate Wars, and his background is national security. He was in the three navies. He's the only person who uh, I think has served in. Royal Canadian Navy, the Royal Navy, and the U.S. Navy. Anyway, he, uh, he has argued quite readily in favor of geoengineering as a way to uh, deal with uh, continuing warming, more and more warming. And of course, for those who don't know, geoengineering involves throwing up all sorts of stuff into the atmosphere and above to try to block the continuing rays. Do you think that at some point, I mean, it will actually be a, a sign that uh, things are getting so bad that we need something like that. Have you given any thought to <clears throat> what kind of a backlash that would give uh, if that had to be used, it seems to me that's a, a sort of a dangerous subject. Geoengineering is a, is a generic sort of name that has a broad encompassment of a whole pile of technologies. 
but most of the ones are related to, I think, what you're suggesting, where they're talking about solar dimming, for example. Right. Uh, my personal opinion is, is playing with fire when your house is already burning. Let's just think this through for a minute. Let's say Canada or any country said, oh, I got this great geoengineering project that's going to cause solar dimming. And the science, there's no doubt it's going to work. How do you implement that? Because if you try to do anything, you have now influenced every single country in the world by your actions. How do you control it? Is it possible it can get out of control? If it gets out of control, you are finished. The atmosphere is, 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 is not a test tube. We've already proven with fossil fuels how we can frig up the climate. And so generally, because there is only one climate for the world, there's only one atmosphere for the world, you can't do ge geoengineering unless you influence, you affect everyone's climate. No. I generally believe it's, it's an unwise thing to do. And the one thing about climate change is that, you know, you talk about, well, it gets so bad that you have to do something. The thing about climate change is, when you're talking about GHG emissions, it will always get worse until you stop those emissions. So even if you do some geoengineering and some, by some miracle, it helps a little bit. It's, 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 it's like putting a bandaid because you cut your arm, but you, you've got cancer, you still gotta get rid of it or something. And so it, it's, it can't be a solution. And I, it's, I'm hard pressed to see how the risk could ever justify such an, uh, a high risk action. No. Thank you for that very useful warning. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, thanks. And uh, next in line is Gabriella Grafinis. Uh, followed by Peter Bukowski. Hello, Dr. Kadney. Um, I, I, I believe um, my question has been indirectly answered already, but I, I, I still will ask you, um, I'm, I'm very interested in the you, your use of the social media platforms. And you've been very, very successful with Twitter. Um, are you using other social medias, which ones do you find the most useful and the most, uh, th that has the biggest, I mean, by your user, we might think it's Twitter, but I'm curious if you're thinking these days of other media uh, platforms. And by the way to everyone, please call me Gerald. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I got on Twitter, as I mentioned before, because my, my son suggested, I have a Facebook account. I, I don't use it very much. Uh, I have been contacted by people on Facebook that want to use Climate Brawl in Facebook. If they said, I don't own Climate Brawl, but anyone can use it any place they want to, but I thought it was kind of cute that they wanted to use it in Facebook. And there certainly is climate denialism within Facebook, uh, Instagram, you know, YouTube is, is horrible for it. You can go through any of the social media platforms. Uh, I may be wrong about this, but I seem to, Twitter works very well for climate denialism. And the reason for that is, and this is true for whatever you're arguing about, you know, I, I say, this theory is wrong. And in the 120 characters, or forget the characters that you have in Twitter, it's very easy to say it's wrong. But for me to come back and to say, well, the reason that it is right is because of all the science that I know about in the whole world that says it's right, I'm going to have to write two or three pages to potentially do it. So right to begin with, in all these arguments, the same in a debate, by the way, if you're on a stage with four or five people, and that's why scientists generally don't like doing debates about science. It's not because they're scared of the debate. They're at a huge disadvantage because science takes time to explain. Attacking science, any fool can do it in 30 seconds. Remember, the attacks aren't based on facts. They're based on some stupid comment the person has to, has to say. So Twitter really sets itself nicely for climate denialism. And it's an echo chamber. 
social media generally is a problem because what it does is it brings fringe groups out of the woodwork because instead of being stuck in their own little corner somewhere where they can just mumble themselves what's going on, they now have hundreds of people around the world that are fringe groups like them and they just feed off each other. And so that's where social media has been a real, real problem. Now going back to Twitter for a second, well, how do you defend against the propaganda of the climate deniers? I started off defending the science. You know, I said, well, here is a link to the IPCC or here is a link to NASA. NASA's site is fantastic, by the way. Hmm. It, it wasn't working that well for me. I said, well, screw this. Why am I defending science? I'm going to make them defend their accusations. That was a game changer for me. Because they can't defend their accusations. Yeah. Oh, what peer-reviewed science did that appear in? You hear silence. No. Where did you get that graph from? That's a favorite one on Twitter. You'll get people att attach a picture of a graph. You're right. I can tell you when it's from a climate denier, 95% of the time it's from some denier blog site. It's never seen a scientific journal ever, and it never will see a scientific journal. Yeah. So that's, I know I'm going off topic a little bit, but how I, 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 I change things on, on Twitter instead of defending science. I'm trying to make the climate deniers defend themselves. And when the opportunity arises, I deliberately try to discredit them. You have to realize that on someone like Twitter, and it may be true, I think it's true for a lot of the social media sites, the loud, angry voices that I hear literally hundreds of times per day are not the average climate deniers. The average climate deniers, like I mentioned, there's over 100 million of them in the US. They're like most of they're they're part of the silent majority in this case. And so they are not these type of people. But I see the worst of the worst, and anyone who looks at this will see the worst and the worst of these people on, on social media. And so they, they have to be exposed for what they are. How much time do you spend on oh, this? Oh. <laughs> I, the nice thing being sort of retired, right? I literally spend 10 to 12 hours a day, every single day of the year. That's an amazing work. That's one way of describing that, it. <laughs> amazing and hard, very hard work. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much. Really, what a dedication. Thank you. And looking forward to your, um, to your books. Good, good. Uh, yeah, I, I've just wrapped up the, the last one. I'm just looking for a publisher right now. Well, good. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Great. Thank you. So next in line is Peter Brokowski and Barry Bruce is on deck. Hi, Peter Bolkowski here. Uh, I'm a, also a chemist, uh, Dr. Cretney, uh, three degrees and 40 years working in oil and gas. You comment that we, we've known since the 80s, and, but little has been done. Uh, I take us back, uh, there, there, there are always multiple reasons, but if I go back to Occam's razor and say what's the largest reason, it is undoubtedly cost people, if they have an opportunity, will buy a lower cost product. If they have to pay a lot more for the same product or potentially a product of lower quality, they will not buy it. The Canadian government, by the clean fuel standards and the carbon tax, has admitted that they have to increase the cost of energy by at least a factor of three if they're going to reach their goals of displacing fossil fuels. How can you ignore cost as the primary driver when that is going to affect everybody to a tremendous degree? Good point. When, but first of all, when you're talking about cost, let's make sure we're talking about net cost. There is a huge cost of doing nothing. And if you look at what, let's call it big oil did had to do with coal and other oil companies as well. But what happened with big oil in the late 1980s has continued. It's one thing that the public rebels against high cost, if there is such a thing. And by the way, a high cost is not a reason for not doing anything. There's lots of things you can do that have very little costs associated with it. Some of them to do something more meaningful, I agree with you, there may be a cost. 
what the oil industry has been pushing since the very beginning. And the American Petroleum Institute, on behalf of its members, still pushes to this day to do nothing. That has nothing to do with cost. Now, having propaganda campaign where you're attacking science and you're attacking some of the leading climate scientists in the world, that has nothing to do with cost. That has to do with a malicious campaign to slander people for their own profits. And so cost is an excuse that people, people go through, but it has not been a major reason why politicians have not done more about climate change. If that was the case, you know, then you keep a lower climate uh, price, a lower carbon price started earlier. If you look at the simply getting rid of, of uh, let's say fossil fuel use, Ontario had one of the most impressive reductions in fossil fuel use in history. Ontario had the largest coal power fired power plant in the world, I think at the time, outside of Hamilton. And so things can be done. Was there a price to it? Yes, there was some cost. But again, you're not taking into account the, the, the cost of what climate change is, which gets work all the time. So my general feeling is anyone says that, well, the government didn't do anything because of cost. Uh, I, I don't buy that. Now, cost did hurt the Clinton administration because what they had done was when they introduced their BTU tax, they didn't try to analyze what that cost would be. So I may not be giving you an answer you like, but I don't think cost is valid reason for any government not to have done what they've done so far on climate change. You'd say an increase in our energy costs of a factor of three or more is an acceptable price for uh, everybody to pay. You're just making that up. No, sir. The, you take the carbon tax and the renewable fuels uh, or the clean fuel standard and you apply those to fossil fuels, it means you increase the cost of fossil fuels by a factor of three or more. Uh, you, you're making your numbers up because I can tell you one thing, you're, you're, you're sounding like I'm listening to Jason Kenney or, or Doug Ford. Uh, what they conveniently leave out of this is, is the carbon rebate. How do you the way the carbon? rebate is the way the rebate is set up is that you actually get the rebate before you spend the money. It's in the previous year's income tax form. Which and does so not apply to middle you're, income. You're increasing three to four times. Uh, the carbon tax works well in terms of giving rebates as long as it fails in removing the use of fossil fuels. If the carbon tax is successful, there are no fossil fuels, there is no carbon tax, there is no source for rebates. Sir, I'm not quite sure what you're trying to tell me. The carbon tax only works as long as it fails. What the carbon tax is, is basically a sin tax. Why is there a tax on, a huge tax on cigarettes? It's meant to be a discouraging way of getting people not to be willing to smoke so much. In the case of the price on carbon, we have the advantage is that if you can give yourself a low carbon footprint, you can actually make money of it. And that's because of the rebate. So the, car the price on carbon is internationally recognized by economists as a market-based mechanism and this is the frustrating part when you, when you talk to conservatives, for example. Conservatives are supposed to support market-based mechanism. It, it, the price on carbon has been around as that for like 30 years. And so why conservatives are against a price on carbon makes no sense. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I know you're on the other side and we're trying well, but I, I do appreciate the question. Great, thanks. Okay, so uh, next in line is Barry Bruce. Thank yeah. you. And, um, thank, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Gerald, for uh, your talk so far. We've talked a lot about oil and gas. 
but uh, agricultural practices and related food problems are also major contributors to clim climate change. They are not. Uh, they're not? Sorry, oh. I didn't say anything. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Um, so what is your experience with um, anti-climate change propaganda from the agricultural and food uh, sectors? I try to run my life by the KISS principle. Keep it short and simple. And, and so my focus by far has been on burning of fossil fuels. It's the largest point sources of greenhouse gas emissions. It's the largest industrial sector for greenhouse gas emissions. And it does mean there's not another, other sectors that could help and agriculture is certainly one. Personally, I find agriculture is a little bit more complicated uh, overall. Uh, I can tell you, for example, that I get attacked not only by climate deniers, but also uh, vegan zealots. And the idea is that if you're not a pure vegan, you cannot support action against climate change. When you're dealing with climate change, what you have to look at, it's not what I say, it's not what you say, it's not what someone else is saying. What's important is that you believe that climate change is real and that you have to do something to stop it. But what you do is up to you. Whether you get an electric car when you have the opportunity, where you take the bus, whether you, you don't eat meat anymore, whether you recycle more, those are personal choices. So the one thing I don't like to do is to say, you have to do this, because that's not the way it should work. The important thing is that you recognize the dangers and you're going to do as much as reasonable that you can do. The government there is acting as a stimulus, going back to the price in carbon. There is a stimulus for you, oh, I can save money if I do this as well. Not only am I helping the environment, but I'm going to save myself some money. So it's whatever works for you. And so certainly look at the, you know, whether it's related to the agricultural products you use. And there's a big contra talk out there about, you know, how the, the joke in America is that, that the Democrats want you to stop eating hamburgers, right? That's what the uh, New Green Deal or the Green New Deal is about. You know, hamburgers are going to disappear and stuff like that. Of course, that's just, that's just political spin and propaganda. But it's certainly... Uh, the agriculture area is, is important, but I think they need more government help to do it than more, most other sectors to do. It's not so much as the uh, big oil and gas sector is. There's also big ag, but there's still a lot of smaller farmers, <clears throat> excuse me, out there as well. So you don't find that there's um, propaganda coming back from corn producers or soybean producers uh, saying that agriculture is not the problem. Yeah, there's, there, there's propaganda from uh, every, all sectors that feel threatened by this. But when you look at the, I would call it malicious propaganda, it's, it's dominated by the fossil fuel industry. Their track record is unmatched, except by the, maybe the earlier tobacco industry. And so don't get me wrong, I'm not making excuses for, for big ag. Uh, you know, big corporations generally will fight things as they go along. It's just that it got totally out of hand uh, uh, with the fossil fuel industry. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, okay, I'm trying to get Mary Egan to unmute and come on. Mary, are you there? Gerald, so nice to see you. It's been oh, almost wow. 10 years since we worked together. Wow, <laughs> this is wonderful. <laughs> and, and I'm partly asking my question because Gerald and I sat on the same community board called the Ottawa Echo Talent Network, which has been going on and is still strong. And the reason it's strong right now here in Ottawa is because particularly with the pandemic, people are 
taking community action a little more seriously because it's doable and they don't have to get into all this political stuff and and just go out and do their thing. But um, but still, we've got a long way to go. And my question to you, Gerald, and I'm so intrigued with your present career and what you're learning and trying to do, is how can climate deniers and those people belonging to the political bases of uh, denying climate um, take positive climate action and still keep their sense of identity, their dignity, and keep their important friends that are in their bubble? How do they do it? Uh, next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> It is, I think we all agree it's, it's, I think it's more so in the US, but it's getting that way more in Canada, how polarized the tribalism has become in political circles. And the real scary part of that, I always thought that people, doesn't matter what party you supported, you were trying to do what was right for your, the country as you saw it. So it's okay you're more right wing or you're more conservative and you see what the future of the country should be like. But if you like what's happening in a lot of political parties, and it's probably happening, it's happening on the left as well. But let's pick on the Republicans in the US, which I have studied the most. I can tell you they don't care about the United States of America. They care about the Republican Party. And that's when tribalism has gone way too far. Republicans got to the stage that if you suggested that you supported action on climate change, forget about what that action is. You were ostracized by the party. And one of the prime examples of that was John McCain. He fought for some action on, on climate change and he, as the years passed by, he was pushed more and more in anyone within the Republican Party that there's a little small number. No, it's not because they're objecting to their policies. They're objecting because they're even willing to discuss it. That is wrong. How do you get out of that? I have no idea. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, I can tell you, if, if you follow the Republican presence since Reagan, so from Ronald Reagan to H.W. Bush to W. Bush to Donald Trump, the tr degradation of American democracy and policy development it is atrocious. If this continues, I can't think of what's gonna happen when the next American president is a Republican comes in because either it will finally hit the extreme and start coming back to some sort of normality where people can have discussions or you are truly headed towards dictatorship. I know I'm going off on the tangent here and wandering off, but I don't see what the next step is because every single one, it seems to get worse as it goes on. I probably haven't really answered your question, but that's my comments. I just um, pick up on one thing uh, and I can understand what you're saying and I find it hard to accept, but I think you might be right, <laughs> is if people, join their neighbors and their local community because they're seeing some new and rather very unfortunate problem happening locally due to climate extremes and they get their act together and we don't ask each other which tribe or which party we're belonging to we just agree on taking simple steps like growing more crops so that we have healthy local food for people that don't have access to it. That's as simple as that. I guess I know it's tiny little steps, but how close are we to maybe changing someone in terms of voting? To me, politicians are who people end up voting for, for a lot of the reasons just you've just given. I'm just wondering, where the tipping point on that one might be? That's a good question. When you look at, when you look at handling, uh, doing something about climate change, 
the climate crisis. It has to be led by governments and corporations. Now, we don't directly control the government. I'll come back to that in a minute. And we certainly don't co control the corporations. But that doesn't mean that we have no influence, that there is not a lot that we can do. There is a lot that the individual can do. And what we have to be careful of, and actually this goes back to the China question a little bit too. People will say, oh yes, I believe in, in, in the cl climate change. And they do this, meaning it's everyone else's fault. It's China's fault. It's Alberta's fault. It's, 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 it's Exxon's fault. You know, it's, it's Donald Trump's fault. Well, I can tell you that doesn't help anybody. So we want to put pressure on our politicians. We want to put pressure on corporations, which we can by our, by our, our, our purchasing, but there's actions that we can do. And there's three major sectors that we as individuals completely control. We don't have to depend on anyone else helping, helping us whatsoever. One is to act. Take care of your greenhouse gas emissions in your own home first. Then worry about your community. Then worry about your city. Then worry about your province and go out from there. You can engage, whether it's, a, it's on Twitter or it's in a meeting like this, or it's a demonstration like the climate marches at the end of, uh, near the end of 2019. The most powerful tool we have as individuals is to vote. We really decide who our politicians are. As long as we do that, how can we blame them for what they're doing right or wrong? We're the fools voting them in. And we have a tendency to do it over and over again. We always have excuses why. And the point of, of when you vote, you always have to make a decision. You can't have 10 number one priorities. You've got to decide what your priority is and vote for the person that you believe is going to do the best job for you. And if people don't consciously try to make that decision, you know, well, I voted conservative for 10 years or 20 years, I'm still going to vote or liberal, it doesn't matter. You have to think of realistically what is best when it comes to climate change. I'll vote for you anytime, Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we're going to go to uh, Bill Reese now, and I'm going to follow that with Arna Kristen Anderson, Anna's daughter. Excuse me. Bill, are you there? Oh, he was un unmuted a moment ago. Go ahead. There we are. Something happened to the mic. Can't hear you. Why don't you say something, Bill? No. <laughs> okay. Can, we cannot hear you, Bill. We still can't. We don't have your... Bill, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to pass over to Arna, and I'm going to come back. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah. Okay. I don't know what was going on there. Okay. okay. Uh, I said thank you for a terrifically interesting conversation, uh, but it... Before I posted my note, I should have made a couple of remarks. First of all, isn't climate change one symptom of a much bigger problem? I mean, we're, we're in a state of overshoot where there's simply too many people using too many uh, resources on the planet so that the ecosphere simply can't regenerate at the same rate that we're affecting it. Yes, climate change is a huge problem, but it's only one component of that bigger problem of overshoot. You also said something really important about the, the costs of goods and services in reference to the carbon tax. A carbon tax is an attempt to internalize externalities, as any economist would tell you. But if we were really to internalize the externalities of climate change and all of the other things we are doing, the price of goods and services would be out of reach for most people. I think we really have to understand that we're getting almost all of our goods and services from the computers and cell phones that we're using at far below their real costs production. And if governments were to move to 
uh, address that issue, uh, there'd be a revolution. By the way, it would be justified to do those things, but people simply wouldn't put up with it. So that's some reflections that come from the conversation so far. Now I want to get to my question. Uh, recent science uh, in climate suggests that we're really ignoring most of the climate models used by IPCC, for example, do not address or include uh, many of the short term and long term feedbacks. And once these are incorporated, we find that there's virtually no uh, carbon budget remaining if we wish to uh, avoid one and a half degrees mean global warming. And even if we want to uh, avoid two degrees mean global warming, which could be catastrophic in the sense that we could spin into a hot earth, hot house earth scenario. Um, we really have to decarbonize the economy entirely by about 2030, not 2050. Now, that's an impossibility theorem. It can't be done. Uh, for one thing, we need energy in abundance and there are no real substitutes for fossil fuel in quantity. Certainly there are fringe applications in electricity generation, but for the main part of, of fossil fuel use, it's still 84% of our primary energy. And we cannot, by any stretch of the imagination, substitute anything uh, by 2030 for that vast quantity of energy. So what do we really do in a circumstance where we're going to have climate change because we will see one and a half degree of mean global warming by 2030 and we're headed certainly for over two degrees by 2050 and there really are no alternatives to fossil fuel yet we need the energy to maintain the economy. This is an unprecedented conundrum and it's all just part of a much bigger problem all of which can be solved if we really a cut back in consumption and population by very large amounts that people aren't willing to contemplate. Any comment? Next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use this a lot. Uh, oh. Your comment about, first of all, being a greater of a bigger problem. Yes, that's true. Uh, climate change is part of, of, of uh, the, the sustainability of the world cannot exist the way we're growing right now. But we got to solve this problem first. The other one is a huge one. I don't even know where to start on that one. Doing something about climate change is a start. When you talk, start talking about, well, the price of energy would have to be uh, $500 a kilowatt or whatever the number would be. Politicians are dumb, but they're not that dumb. Okay, so that's not going to happen. What I'm nervous about conversation like the one we're just having we're so far away from what you're describing. It's, 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 it's ludicrous. We're in this problem and I, it's, this is an excuse. The whole idea was science was ready and the politics should have been ready to start doing this in 1990. If we had started in 1990, we wouldn't be having this discussion at all. It, we would be well on our way. But because we put it off, we put it off, we put it off, we put it off. We are in that sort of situation. Now, I also understand, and I've seen some reports myself that, you know, really we have to get this done by 2030. How are we gonna do that? Well, and let's just say for the moment, it is impossible for whatever reason. I don't care. What you have to do, there is so much we could be doing right now that doesn't take us anywhere near those extremes that, that you're worried about. There's another problem. People get confused about this 1.5 to two degree limit that Paris has come up with. There's no science behind that. What they had to do is they took a little bit of an arbitrary target because you need a target to shoot for. Because it, what, what happens when you hit two degrees Celsius? It's not that you've hit a new plateau. And then, oh boy, the weather is lousy now. We're just gonna to have to live with it. If we don't reduce emissions, it's going to keep on getting worse. It doesn't plateau. It's gonna go up to 2.5, then it'll go up to three, and then it'll go up to 3.5. Heaven help us if we ever hit a true tipping point, which we have not hit yet, and we may not hit one. But there is no, 
saying, oh, well, since we can't, it's okay, because we, we'll adapt. We'll adapt at two degrees Celsius and however we do that as we go along. This is an issue that has to be addressed as quickly as possible. Whether it can be done by 2030 or not, I don't know, you could very well be right. But it's not an excuse for doing a lot of action right now. And you gotta remember, if we're not there by 2030 and we are up by two degrees Celsius, we're having the same discussions that we're having now, except that then we're gonna say, well, we gotta keep it to 2.5 degrees Celsius or three degrees Celsius. Well, let me disagree a little bit. First of all, I'm not arguing we shouldn't be doing something. I'm arguing that what we're doing and most of the discussion of what we should be doing is completely inadequate if the science is correct. And as far as tipping points are concerned, the Arctic is melting. And if we see uh, fresh water throughout the Arctic Ocean by say 10 years from now, that will be a tipping point in terms of increasing the rate of warming. So things are going to get worse. And the, the fear is from what we know from complexity of science is that there are hidden tipping points and thresholds that you can't even identify until you've crossed them. And then you're in a situation of, of literally runaway climate change where it doesn't much matter what you do. So I, I think we won't be having a similar conversation at two degrees. Nobody knows. It may be two degrees, it may be three degrees of warming that puts us into a runaway state. But historically, if we look at the, the geoclimatic uh, reference going back two million years, we've seen this happen over and over again. Uh, the earth, earth has been a hell of a lot warmer than it is now at comparable levels of carbon dioxide. And that I think is a huge worry for, if not this generation, certainly future generations. So I am urging very much more urgent action than anybody's prepared to talk about now. But it does mean massive cutbacks in our energy supply and in the supply of goods and services. And frankly, ultimately we've got to deal with the population question. And when we talk about reducing consumption and reducing population, the conversation generally stops because people don't want to do what's necessary to cure the main problem, which I would argue is overshoot of which climate change is the, is the major and obvious uh, symptom right now. Fair enough. Okay. Great. Thank you. Excellent. So I want to uh, turn this over to Arna Christine Ina's daughter. Uh, Ted Manning is on deck. Uh, Arna has to run in a couple of minutes. Hope we get your answer. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this conversation. I'm really, it's very enlightening and it's really, I'm learning so much. So I'm, um, I'm a musician, that's my background. I now work as a managing director for the NEC Orchestra. I very much believe that, you know, the role of the arts in actually changing people's sort of, you know, I feel like, you know, the science has brought us all the statistics and now we need to internalize and start to understand this on an emotional level. But my question to you, Gerald, was more, um, yeah, and just to the point of, you know, uh, you know, the previous uh, speaker is just, you know, that, I, so I'm from Iceland and I've really seen the effect of the climate crisis happening. I'm talking about the, the stream, the Gulf Stream that is now weakening and what that will mean to Iceland is, is, is devastating. Although they've experienced the warmest winter there for a long time now, no snow in Iceland, I tell you. <laughs> but anyways, I wanted to ask a, a question if, if there's anything that we can actually, um, well, learn from, from the pandemic, the COVID crisis in the way that how that has affected the whole global ecosystem and, you know, and shown us that, you know, yes, when we, I mean, I never believed that anything like this could happen. You know, when I was hearing about the virus in China and the lockdowns in Wuhan, I thought, yeah, that happens in China. And then suddenly I'm here in Ottawa having that same experience. And this is in a Western country. So it's, you know, I'm just wondering, is this, is this an opportunity for us for, you know, in, way, in the way we deal and talk about the climate crisis? But I'm sorry, I have to leave, okay. you know, in, in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Arna, you can come back and hear the answer later if you need to go. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but I'll, I'll wait until I have to leave. <laughs> okay. This is a question that's been raised by a, a lot of people. It's a thoughtful one, and it's interesting. I'm a little bit cynic about these sort of things. In a few years from now, I think we're, we're going to forget about all this stuff. And I think the longer term impact on the uh, environment, not in other ways, but on the environment, 
we're going to forget this and it's going to be a blip. Uh, one thing I quickly, just quickly go on to about, I, the, the carbon dioxide measurements for the atmosphere are usually used from the Keeling curve that's in Hawaii. The Keeling curve has kept on going up. It didn't ever say, well, that just shows it's wrong because we reduced our emissions, so the Keeling curve should be going down. But what they don't know is that the atmosphere is like a leaking bucket. So as long as you keep on putting water into that bucket, no matter how much water you put in, there's a little bit that leaks out the bottom, but it keeps on rising higher and higher and higher. So until you get to net zero, that bucket is going to keep on filling up. And so carbon dioxide emissions are going to keep on rising. And as long as they rise, the temperature by definition has to rise with it. Does that answer your question anyway? Yeah. It's a pity if we can't learn anything from this stuff. Yeah, I, 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 and, and maybe, maybe the world will surprise me, but I, I, again, people just generally aren't like that. I think it's going, we're going to change our healthcare system and hopefully be more prepared for next time. There will be good things that come out of it, but on the environment side, I, my, it's just my feeling is, is that it, it won't be much. It's just like the infrastructure spending. Not enough of it's going to, to, towards things that could help as we're going along, it's going to a lot of good causes, but not a lot of it's going for clean energy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm sorry I have to leave. Thank you for this. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, next we have Ted Manning, followed by Peter Michael. Well, thank you very much, Gerald. That was very intriguing. And I particularly liked the notion of how do we deal with uh, disinformation? Uh, I'm throwing another one out, the nuclear industry, because it has been uh, touted as a panacea and as the worst thing since having your, your city bombed. Uh, how do we, is it possible to bring a solution which might involve nuclear or new nuclear or something into the dialogue? Or, and how does that factor into your very interesting talk on on disinformation and false information? I often get asked about nuclear, especially when I go to universities. So it just shows how young you are at heart. Hmm. The nuclear is the solution to climate change. Mm -hmm. The one that tells you that is, is misleading you. And just like we, we often talk about propaganda from the right, there's mm -hmm. a lot of propaganda from the left about mm -hmm. nuclear. That said, nuclear does come with its own garbage. Mm -hmm. And so some people ask, and this has come up a lot, like how do we replace the fossil fuels? I leave others to determine what the best solutions are. The IPCC has a full book that's on mitigation. It's yeah. the full book. So yeah. you don't have to go to me or anyone else, you look through the book. The IPC IPCC is not allowed to rate their options. It's mm -hmm. against their rules that politicians forced upon them. So you can look in there and there's lots of options that can reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. Which one's is right for you doesn't mean it's right for your neighbor or anything else. When you look at nuclear generally, sorry, let's back up. What you have to look at is a balance. Doesn't matter what your solution is. What is the cost of that solution? Mm -hmm. Nuclear is very expensive. Yep. What are the risks? They have nothing to do with greenhouse gas emissions because there's very little, it's almost zero from a nuclear plant. If you're talking about base load for electrical rates and you're talking about replacing your, your fossil fuels, nuclear is a great way of getting a base load as you're going along. Make a long story short, is it doesn't matter if it's solar or if it's nuclear or if it's hydro, hydro comes with its own baggage when you're talking about major dams and the rest of it is concerned. You have to look at a balanced approach and what works for you. And economics comes into it and also side effects. Here in Ontario, people don't even think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, people are talking about before about so how much we depend on fossil fuels. Fossil fuels is like 10 or 20% of the, from natural gas that we use in Ontario. All the risk is, is not. A big factor, I forget the number, I think it's about 40% is from nuclear. We've had nuclear in Ontario for decades. If somebody announced that they're building a new nuclear plant, people in Ontario would probably pass out. Mm -hmm. But those plants have been safe as can be. France has what, 90% or 80% yep. of the power from nuclear? 83. And, and, and you saw how, how many times they've had problems. 
Mm -hmm. But that said, there is an inherent risk with nuclear. In my opinion, the biggest risk with nuclear is what do you do with the waste? Mm -hmm. There still is not a real technological solution to that. If people say, well, that's easier to handle than something else, that's fair and good. And so I guess where I'm trying to go with this story is don't eliminate anything out of hand if it comes from a reputable source to begin with. And carefully look at the balance of uh, pros and cons. Thank you very much, Cheryl. That's uh, exactly what I was hoping you would <laughs> you would run at. Uh, I worked with uh, waste, uh, coming up with waste disposal solutions to the Canadian government for a number of years, and you're right on. Oh, thank you. Great, thanks. <laughs> just, uh, just before we get to Peter, there's, uh, there's an interesting small risk, short-term risk, with nuclear that yep. they did experience in France, which was that it got so hot that they couldn't adequately cool their plants, yep. and they had to cut back. And that was because the water in the river was too hot. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, we're going to move to Peter. And um, after that, we have Gene to wrap up our session. Mm -hmm. hey, thanks very much, Gerald. Uh, I'm a physicist, but uh, way back in the late 60s, I got very interested in the role of technology in society, including nuclear. So that uh, is where I have come into a lot of this. Uh, there's been a lot of interest lately in three books uh, in particular, one by Rand, another by Bill Gates, and now Carney, Mark Carney, uh, on where the finances are going to come from and how to mobilize the private sector and private financing into solving some of these problems because it will cost money, as has been noted. And I have been incredibly impressed by a number of webinars that The Economist is running. There's one going on right now on how to incorporate, well, a whole range of things. But for example, you talked about pricing in the hidden costs. And this is, again, one of the elements that is coming up. And the work on incorporating climate risk into financial decisions and investment decisions and the the idea of the the hidden costs as well and there is a lot of work going on that i wasn't aware of but the economist webinars have brought this out and frankly i'm quite encouraged by i know there's a lot more to be done but at least it is shows real movement in the private sector and it's not just greenwashing so what I would like to uh, ask you is how important do you think it is that the private sector be mobilized and get involved in, in doing things about this and incorporating the true cost as much as they can? And then the second question, which is a much broader one, but I would like to know what you think KCOR can do just generally to help out with the climate change issue. Thank you. I've, I've been a fan of Mark Carney's for a long time. Uh, less so in the last month or two, but he's still an okay guy. <laughs> he has pushed for a long time that markets should be the one leading the fight against the climate crisis. And I actually have to agree with him. They're the ones that should be, because when that happens, I don't think the rest of us are going to have to do a lot. That, that's sort of like the snowball going down the mountain. And now it's really taking off when the markets start to dictate it. We're seeing a little bit of that right now. We're seeing some major financial institutions around the world, banks and private investment firms, some of the largest in the world, restricting how they're going to invest in fossil fuels. That's not a final answer, but at least it's a start. Business reacts to where they can get money from. Uh, stock markets are tr trying to push that the risk of climate change in a business should be recognized because that is a shareholder risk. Shareholder activism is closely related to what you're describing as well. Uh, that will be very important as it goes on. 
So those are nice steps that for once it seems to be happening. And so it's very important it happens. It's very important it happens quickly. But what's going to push that? Well, hopefully we will to somewhat. Politicians can push it. Everything can push it. But once that market driven, and I mean financial market driven, has taken control, you won't need any government policies. They'll control it all by themselves. What can KCOR do? Well, hopefully having information sessions like this helps as it goes on. Remember what I was talking about, I would think that you're, it, it's sort of like a, uh, what individuals can do. You act, you engage, you vote. Now you guys don't all have to vote for the same party as you're going along, but you, you may have people you want to discuss about, you know, what should be the deciding factors when we vote for the next election? What should we do as a, as a group to engage, get other people interested in, in combating climate change? Uh, 350.org. Had a, had a campaign across the world and there was dozens of sites across Canada that were trying to engage people of getting together in small groups and promoting action on climate change. So I don't have a direct answer what, what the uh, Canadian Association of the Club of Rome should, should do. The important thing is do something. Great. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we're gonna go over to Jean Doherty, president of our organization, excuse me, chairperson of our organization. Um, you're, you have time for one more question, uh, if you wish, otherwise you can thank us. Gerald, would you like to answer one more question? Or? I would love to answer one more question. Okay. Dave, who, yeah. who is to ask? You. Okay, all right. <laughs> Anything you want. Well, anything I, go that I well, actually, I am absolutely flummoxed in, in trying to answer that, uh, what question to ask, but, you, you know, a little more pedantic kind of question. Um, do you think, do you think it's more important to try and go after politicians, uh, private corporations, celebrities to try and influence what's going on? Or, or do you have a feel for that with respect to um, influencing people about climate change? My general comment would be yes. And, and, I'm, not, and, and I'm not facetiously either. Do everything you can. Okay. The, I think as far as really making a difference though, my own personal opinion is vote, nothing is more important than voting. Uh, People have voted in climate deniers into the highest offices of, uh, of a country. Are they insane? You know, I, I, I just can't fathom that sort of thing, but it happens. And so, but, the, but really do whatever you can. Uh -huh. You know, if you happen to, you know, you follow Leonardo DiCaprio, who's a big promoter, or Jane Fonda, who's another big promoter of action on climate change encourage her on Twitter that you say, boy, it's fantastic what you're doing. Gee whiz, you're 80 years old, not DiCaprio, Jane Fonda. And, you know, you're doing a great job out there and stuff like that. And so, yes, do everything you can, but really think here. The one thing that drives me up the wall is people that don't vote. And I understand, especially with the younger generation, they feel disenfranchised. They, they feel that the whole system has failed them. And, you know, and, and so there's this thing, I grew up being not voting was a sin. And especially when you're talking about the importance of the issues we have now, I guess every generation has issues like this that they must have. You have to vote for somebody. Okay, that, thank you for that. I, um, I would like to say, uh, as Dave has said, as president or chairman of KCOR, um, I would really like to thank you so much for your willingness to participate in today and to set up this conversation and the insights and the information that you've given us really is wonderful food for thought and will i hope spur spur many of our members to really start uh becoming more engaged at the moment we're we're really trying to become more activist rather than just a think tank and this is giving given some real thoughts as to how we might proceed. So thank you so much. This has just been wonderful. And uh, I wish you well. And I hope uh, I hope you continue with all of your climate denying. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. The questions have been fantastic. They all were. And I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all so very, very much.